It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio, flavored with a dash of humor. Welcome to intelligent, irreverent talk about plants and the planet they grow on. Your questions, comments, and participation are always welcome on Facebook and Instagram at The Mike Novak Show and at Mike Now on Twitter. Good planets are hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. And true currents and thriving seas. Wind blowing through breathing trees. Strong ozone and safe sunshine. Well, good planets are hard to find. Good planets are in the main. Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Jet streams, perfect air. And here they are, Peggy Malecki and Mike Nova. Good planets are in the main right. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to the show. As you can see, I've decided, well, let's tilt that, see if I go like that, put my head out of Ooh, the way. You, you got the banner behind I you. I decided cool. to go a uh, full banner here. We're going uh, uh, full banner. So, uh, nice. except, except uh, I can move. I got the marmot behind me. You got marmot. I got, the, marmot. I got the, the veggies up there. The columbine. And the columbine. Uh, speaking of Columbine, we're going to be talking native plants this morning. Mm-hmm. I see we've got a good, this is perfect. Good morning from Berwyn. Hey, Berwyn. Uh, good morning to Snappy J Dog, too. She uh, got she got the first good morning she today. Got, we, we, go. ought to, we ought to give prizes to the people who get the, the first ones in, <laughs> the, the first hellos. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to give away pretty much anything in the house just to get it out of here, okay? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I got a list too. Here, what uh, would you like here? And uh, we've got some snow, not much, but uh, uh, should I do the preview map? If I, no, I can't do the preview map because then it'll just mess everything up for me. Because uh, I had, I don't have it all, everything set up, uh, and it'll put, pop Rick DeMaio's picture up there. But Rick will be talking. Yeah. There's there's snow on the way, and I decided that uh, I'm not taking down my Xmas lights. Uh, until we have a, a, a decent snow in Chicago. Oh, Actually, mine are still on every night. Yeah, I put them on I, every I went, night. I went for a walk the other day and counted 28 houses, 28 houses that still had lights on. Good for them. On. Not just My, up, but on. I think we, we just call them winter lights, put them up, mm-hmm. um, because the way it works, um, there's not enough time before the big holiday, and, uh, and I just I think they're cheery. I like them. Yeah. And so I put mine and on every. When it's every, so dull and dark, yeah, wonderful. Especially if we're going to have some snow. So hey, I see Steve Wenzel's watching this morning. Amos, as always, Amos is like, "Hey, dude, how you doing?" Uh, and we got a great show today. Speaking of columbines back there, perhaps not that one because that's not a. That's not a uh, a straight. Uh, Columbine, that's a cultivar of some kind, uh, and we can ask uh, our guests about that because we're talking uh, growing natives in your backyard, and, and and folks might say, hey, it's January and it's snowing. Well, yeah, this is the time you plan. The whole idea mm-hmm. is that the uh, West Cook Wild Ones are doing a series of seminars um, coming up in uh, February, March, and April about native plants and how to do it right. And we got a couple of people uh, on the show this morning uh, who are going to help us figure out how to do it right. Uh, one of them is uh, is an old friend of the show, Ken Williams, and another is a new friend of the show, um, and that would be Sarah McKell. And uh, we and I will get, find out from her exactly how to pronounce her last mm-hmm. name when we do this. And she's laughing at me right now, so we'll, we'll get to that <laughs> in a second. Uh, and and then uh, at ten o'clock, guess what, folks? We're going back to the southeast side of Chicago because uh, there's still issues down there, and things have not been cleared up. Uh, there are proposals. It's just crazy that every time 
the city of Chicago, or it seems the state of Illinois, I'm, I'm not sure if it's both, uh, want to have some heavy industry. Hey, let's put it in the 10th Ward because they don't care. They're just a bunch of people who love sucking in pollution and drinking poison water. So let's just take it down to the 10th Ward because that's a great place to put it. So we've, we've talked about that on this show umpteen times, and we're going to do it again with uh, Peggy Salazar from uh, the Southeast Environmental Task Force, Force. She will be with us. And uh, uh, she will also be joined by a an Bye. attorney, uh, Nancy Loeb, who is with uh, Northwestern Pritzker School, and uh, so she uh, will be joining us as well. I'm, I'm I realize I haven't even called up. There's just like too many things to call up before the show starts here, but. Uh, uh, Nancy Loeb is the clinical professor of law and the director of the environment. Environmental Advocacy Clinic at Northwestern University Law School's Bloom Legal Clinic. And she said, can we get that up there? I said, no. Uh, the title will be as short as I can make it because that's all I can fit in there. Um, and before we get to our friends here, I just want to remind you, Peggy, that I have 10,000 sparrows still in my backyard. <laughs> uh, the occasional... Well, they, they have to go somewhere. Uh, the thugs uh, have taken over the yard and now I don't put out food all the time. I let them forage for it uh, because they'll knock it all on the ground and then th they have to rummage on the ground. And as soon as I mm -hmm. figure they've gotten it all, everything off the ground, uh, then I'll put some more out. But it's 10,000 sparrows, two cardinals, the occasional junco. Uh, I saw... Probably some morning doves. I haven't seen him. Not seen a morning dove. Have not seen a morning. Nothing. I'm telling you, I saw a robin the other day, and it didn't care about the seed. It was like digging in no. the, the the ground and and they messing, after the feeders, messing up my garden. Uh, so I have to to fix that up. Uh, and I saw something that looked like the largest rat in history. <laughs> um, and Kathleen said, "Was it a possum?" Uh. And I realized it might have been. It might have been a possum. So could be um, if it had if I had realized it was a possum i probably would have left it alone so okay whatever but i i, I looked at it and went there's a rat under the bird feeder so I ran, I ran out and got rid of that so there you go all right welcome to the show well, everybody what oh i was good real quick i stepped out yesterday morning and there was actually a cardinal singing early but i've heard a lot of people reporting they're already hearing cardinal singing and several jays up in the trees too which, which uh, just seems we, early we, we don't get jays here we they they no, been... but i'm just saying it just seems early for the season uh-huh the activity that was out and, yesterday. you know and then our friend pam carlson who, who who does actually live in chicago and gets you know 127 different species of birds and like yeah sure in two minutes in two minutes <laughs> right okay great i'm so glad so happy for you there okay i'm just totally jealous because i i don't get any of that <sighs> stuff down here uh, welcome to the and show. And now on with the show. <laughs> on with the show. Write us in. Uh, put in your comments. Uh, if you've got questions today, uh, we hope we can answer some of them uh, because we've got that guy on the left down there, and that is Ken Wood. Hey. hey and he's moving. And I move. He's moving. I move. Yes. I, yes. Okay. Wow. You know, Ken, you don't, you're not allowed to do what you did to me this morning. Ken did one of those things where, hey, listen, I'm going to try <laughs> something new. You know, here we test it yesterday and everything's working great. And you, no, and eight, I, 854. Yeah, and 854, <laughs> he's going to try something new. And uh, don't do that to me, Ken. Well, well, Mike, what we did yesterday and worked perfectly wasn't working. So I had no, you know. Oh, what, really? Was that the pad that was not working? I was doing. I was doing exactly what I did yesterday, and it wasn't working. So here I am, and we're all good. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I'm glad that it, it looks fantastic. In fact, I can. I can even uh, uh, if I I'll feel. Never, but it's backwards. Wow. Oh, uh oh, now he's now it's like he's looking at himself and going, uh oh. <laughs> Everything's backwards. It's like a mirror. Yeah. It's, you can't read the label. Well, you can't. Anyway. That, yeah. Oh, I can. It says horticulturist person. Yeah. Uh, and uh, whatever that's, that means. Well, you said horticulturist, and I said, well, that's kind of generic. 
And uh, that's what you, so we put the other thing up there. Don't be distracted by Christine. Don't let her distract you at all. Okay. Tell her. To, She's not to, here. Tell her to go. Oh, then. I'm leaving. Okay. Bye, bye Christine. Bye, Christine. Um, bye. We had something else up there. We had a different title for you yesterday, uh, but we're not going to tell people what that is because. Uh, uh, no. no. The family show. It, it, it's a, and Mike. Yes. Mike, you know, there's, there's a little picture of me that's covering your face. Um, oh, you can click that off. But the, you want like, you want actually to cover my face. I, I think that's a good idea. Go to the bottom of the screen, look for the uh, in the center in the and click on the the the, the rectangle there and it pop, should pop it off. Ah, uh, there you go. Okay. And, and there's I, Mike. Here I am. Hi. Yeah. All right. Hi Mike. I'm Hi Ken. You. It's so good to see you. Uh and <laughs> on, on on Ken's right. Now that we got all that nonsense out of the way. Phew. Uh, on Ken's right is is Sarah. Sarah, how do do you pronounce your last name? Mikhail. Mikhail. Okay. Yes. So Sarah Mikhail, um, and she's with the Land Conservancy of McHenry County. What exactly do you do with the Land Conservancy? Um, I talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I engage the community. That's my job title as community engagement specialist. So basically I um, talk to people, teach people about native plants and oak habitat restoration, wetland restoration, all that kind of good stuff. Fantastic. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about this morning because I saw I saw a, uh, a notice a couple of weeks ago uh, that the uh, West Cook Wild Ones, and uh, by the way, who's who, uh, whoever's got their uh, URL in their head right now? Anybody? No, anybody know what that is right off the bat? This is not this is not a trick question. I'm just hoping, Peggy. You're you're it. supposed to die. No, no, you're not, not supposed to look at it. You're just supposed to like call it up on your rundown. Um, no, it's 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 not on the rundown, is it? No. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. We'll just kind of. Uh, no, but the dates are up there on the rundown. The, the dates are up uh, there, but West, West Cook. Cook. Wild Ones. Org. Okay. West Cook. Wild Ones. Org. And uh, uh, you can go there or you can go to, uh, you can go to my website, MikeNovak.net, because I've got all the links there about the various things that are coming up and so what what i saw was that ken who's a uh, horticulturist person uh was going to be doing a seminar in february uh but then i noticed that and i posted it on my show page and then i noticed that a bunch of people started signing up for it and i thought you know let's get ken on to talk about this because he said why are we doing this so early and i said well because it looks like a bunch of people are signing up for it and it's going to fill up really fast and you're nodding sarah and i think that there's uh a a, a demand for this because as we've talked over and over on this show, a lot of people have taken an interest in gardening in the past year i mean we're coming up on the one year anniversary of shutting everything down i know isn't it amazing that that here we are um and so a lot of people have taken to growing food in their backyards but you can't have food without pollinators and one of the ways you get pollinators is to grow native plants and a lot of folks are just interested in the good that native plants do so that's part of the reason you guys are doing this series and it's going to be three um seminars or workshops whatever you want to call them starting with ken's in february so, Ken, before we get to that, tell me a little bit, since you are a, a horticulturist person, person, person guy, I almost wrote horticulturist guy on there. I could change it. Dude. Horticulturist but, but dude. You, dude. But you decided you decide to give me personhood, you know, and not everybody does that. I appreciate <laughs> it, Mike. But I like, I like the idea of the dude. I think that, <laughs> okay, hold on. We're going to change that. A AKA right. uh, the weed assassin. A, yeah, you yeah. are also known as the weed. Yeah. There's uh, dude, not dud. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Now you're a horticulturist dude. Is that work for you? For today, yeah. <laughs> All right. Tell yeah, us a little just bit about. Just don't I, ask me late to dinner. 
uh, I've got your background, but you tell us about your background. Uh, how is it you come to be doing this sort of thing? Just lucky. Um, <laughs> you know, I basically, I blame my, uh, my younger sister. She, um, one day she brought a kohlrabi to the dinner table and, um, it just kind of, you know, that, that's just a moment that stuck to me that, uh, you know, you can put seeds in the ground and come up things that, you know, mom never brought home from the Piggly Wiggly. You could, uh, just bring into the house and eat them. And that, that this growing food thing that I got into it from growing food, but at the same time that I was growing food and sometimes growing a lot of it, I, uh, fell in love with native plants. Um, and this was not where you, you mentioned, you mentioned Piggly Wiggly. So that tells me you're not in Illinois. No, that was Littleton, Colorado is where I grew up. Um, and we actually didn't have a Piggly Wiggly in Littleton, but there was one nearby. <laughs> and um, I just love saying the word. Uh, the um, Littleton? So, Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> Sorry. Pig, it just feels good in your mouth, Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> um, if you can get it out. Yeah, if you can do it. So, you know, um, but then when I started spending more, I went to college in Boulder and which meant, you know, closer to the mountains and more time up in the mountains hiking around. I had a lot of friends who were botany majors. Um, my sister became a botany major. And, um, you know, so I started learning more plant ID and then lived different places. I lived in central Illinois at one time, lived on the West Coast and came and then lived in southeast Kansas for 27 years um, where there's a lot of Premnant rare, uh, premnant rare. Yeah. <laughs> Have some <laughs> coffee, Ken. <laughs> yeah. Okay. A lot of remnant prairie, um, and ended up with the horticulture position at the local park and zoo, and um, found that you know I could use native plants and not have to work so hard. The, the place. <laughs> When I, when I started there, the place had a uh, formal rose garden with over 700 floribunda and hybrid tea roses. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, just suck the life out of your, uh, <laughs> your schedule. You know, you spent so much time doing that. And there was a, a week and a half maybe in early June when it was pretty. Um, but were, those, oh, were, were they all, were, Ken, were they all June bloomers? Well, they would, you, you would get a lot of bloom at the beginning of June and then you would get, you know, intermittent bloom after that. But the fact is that those, those kind of plants, they're not pretty plants. Um, they, my dad had a garden one time that was over on the side of the garage, a, a, a rose garden on the side of the garage where nobody ever walked. And he never had a rose um, bloom because uh, when the bud would be ready to open, he'd cut it off, bring it in the house, put it in a vase. And um, that's, you know, what those kind of roses are good for. Not for <laughs> putting out in the landscape and looking at. Um, they're just not pretty plants. So I used native plants more and more and, uh, you know, started adapting my techniques um, I have to, I have to, I have to stop you there. And if, as you started adding more and more native plants, did people say to you, "Hey, what hap What's happened to the roses? Why did you cut down our roses?" Well, uh, well, the first step, and see, the rose garden was a project of the local garden club. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So I had to, you know, uh, develop a, a capacity. Well, I already had the capacity to eat casseroles which meant I could go to their meetings and, and have them like me. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, I got to know the garden club people and, and it was a gradual process over, over several years. Um, instead of investing the money to replace roses that died, um, I just kept get it, making it smaller. And after a while, people noticed that as the rose garden got smaller, the rest of the park got a lot more beautiful um, because I had time. I wasn't spending all my time in there messing with those things. And, and, as the, and the park really became beautiful. Um, 
and where people wrote letters to the editor about it and stuff. And um, so, you know, that's, and then um, because I belong to a zoo horticulture organization, I belong to the Association of Zoological um, Horticulture. And um, horticulture dudes. Yeah, dudes, a whole bunch of them. And dudettes. And, and went to a conference in Denver and met this crazy woman who was gardening the shed aquarium named Christine <laughs> Nye. And a few years ago, I or a few a few years later, I married her and moved here, and uh, started over. And here we are. There you are, and and you're starting over, and you're teaching people the gospel of native plants and how. Yeah, it's going to take some work when you first start, and and that's some what something we're going to do today. And what I love about what you guys have done, you sent me some photos of, of some of your native garden fails, which I think is important for people. <laughs> I think that's important for people who um, are starting out to know that even the people who have been doing this a long time had to learn to uh, to do it right and uh in fact let's let's bring you in on this uh sarah um is that yeah, part <laughs> yeah why not well you've had a few yourself right <laughs> yeah definitely yeah yeah i made a lot of mistakes in in the very beginning and you know what you guys i'm still making mistakes today but that's that's part of the process and the fun is you're constantly learning so mm -hmm. don't there's nothing that you can't undo <clears throat> that's true absolutely you you can uh do this so let's start with uh the what you call your presentation uh ken i believe is the top 10 things you need to know about starting a I'm paraphrasing, but it's the top it's a top ten things every native gardener needs to know. Okay, top new. ten. Okay. Yeah, new native gardeners need to know because what what the reason they contacted me and the reason they decided to do this last year, uh, West Cook Wild Ones, their plant sale, they had over a forty percent increase in gross sales, and Oops. I've got the numbers. Whoops, numbers Sorry. written down. 54% of the people who participated in their plant sale last year were new, um, had never bought from them before. So that just shows that there is an, you know, there's not just an increased interest in uh, gardening, but there's an increased interest in, in using native plants. People are realizing it. You had, I think, Doug Talamy on your show a year ago, and um, he was talking about that of course, that was just before the lockdown, and people were still doing public presentations. And he said people couldn't find big enough rooms for him to speak in. Yeah, um, well, and, and, and that's because he draws the connection. He he's actually introduced a whole new realm of horticultural thought, uh, which uh, starting about two thousand eight, which is the idea that the you know, and re the rest of us used to talk about native plants. Uh, by saying, yeah, they conserve water, they're easy to take care of once they're established, um, they, they're they adapted to certain areas, and you won't have to worry too much. And then Doug Talamy came along and said, and by the way, our native uh, fauna, meaning insects, are adapted to them as well. And when we put in those roses that are not native, and we put in the peonies, and no offense to people who love their peonies, uh, but uh, and, and butterfly bush... Not butterfly weed, but butterfly bush. We're hurt, hurting the uh, populations of those insects. We are driving them away, and this could have catastrophic results. Uh, so uh, he started in selling the idea that you should plant natives in your yard mm -hmm. because we need our native insects as well to do the work of pollination. Yeah, the the little the little things that run the world, um, as E.O. Wilson said, that that you know the, the the main way solar energy, you know, it goes to a lot of trouble. It comes all the way here from the sun, and plants turn it into chemical energy. And then our idea on landscaping, our traditional idea, is that it should just sit there, and that's crazy. Um, it should get passed on into the animal kingdom, and the main way that that happens 
is not through giraffes and elephants. It's through um, insects um, on all kinds of different levels, um, processing that food, moving it up, and then bigger things eating them and bigger things eating them. Right. And so... So let's yeah, go just, to, you, to to the top 10, and I'm going to ask you this question, and then, Sarah, I'm going to ask you the very same question, which is, what's the first thing you tell people when they decide that they need to have uh, a garden with natives in their backyard? Ken, what's, what's the very first thing they need to know? Well, number one on the list that I'm going to go through in a month is that it's wonderful. Um, I know that's not... You know, it's not that's what not, I was not, looking for, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that, but that is it. Um, it. You know, is that it's wonderful. That just because of the things we were just talking about, all the different life that you get to experience. You know, you just walk out the front door and, you know, d week after week during the summer, I see creatures that I've never seen before. Um, I, I discovered robber flies last summer. Um, which look kind of like bumblebees, but they don't go to flowers. They sit. They just sit on a leaf and look around. Hmm. They move their head a lot like the way a dragonfly does because they're predators. And they're just sitting on a leaf waiting for something to go kill and now, suck the life. Well, that sounds like fun. Uh, anybody oh. <laughs> who's ever had, you know, watched it. Uh, they show up at your bird feeder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And start taking down <laughs> sparrows, which would be great if you ask me. <laughs> Uh, we, I've seen photos of uh, praying mantids that have taken down birds in in flight. Yeah. That's that's terrifying. And and by the way, folks, praying mantises or mantids, um, they're you know a lot of people say, hey, that's a beneficial. No, it's kind of an equal opportunity uh, assassin. It will go after good insects and bad insects. It doesn't care whether they're beneficial or not. It just likes to eat. Um, and uh, that I don't. But what about the rob? It's the robber. Was it a robber? Robber fly. 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 Yeah. I am yeah. not familiar it, with that. Hmm. I I had no idea. But it's one of those things. You know how every once in a while you've never heard a word before, and then you you know discover this new word, and then you see it everywhere. Straight. Right. Yeah, you see it everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Acillidae are the robber fly family, also called assassin flies. Yeah, just just yeah. like you, Ken. Yeah, yeah. The we, weed we, assassin. There's an, there's an affinity there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, Sarah. What do you so, tell? What do you tell people? Make a plan. So that's going to um, include how much sun do you get? How much money are you willing to spend? How much water do you have? Like what you know? How how wet is your soil? Um, or how dry is your soil? There's a native plant for every single place. So I encourage people to look at their property um, as a whole. So use an aerial photo, you know, Google Google Maps, whatever you have. Um, but look at your property as a whole and do it with some thought. And there's groups out there to help you with this. Um, there's a program that was started by the Conservation Foundation, um, which is called Conservation at Home which is what I run for the Land Conservancy of McHenry County. There's other groups too, wild ones. <laughs> All yeah. of these native groups, right? All of these <laughs> native will provide this kind of advisement. But I think it's really important that people go in with a plan instead of just starting to throw random plants in willy-nilly. Okay? People... There's, there's a plant for everywhere. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I will say that conservation at home is in a lot of different counties now, and it's gone into Cook County. So you can find a conservation at home through a Cook County Extension. Uh, and I know because my friend uh, Valerie Kehoe is uh, involved with that. Uh, and, and you can find it in, in – uh, and you get a certificate. You can get a plaque. Mm -hmm. um, yep, designating, you get a nice garden plaque. Uh, designating your land. But the, the important thing, and we, we need to break here – is starting, as you said, Sarah, with uh, a plan. Um, and I know that there are a lot of folks who just, I'm one of them. Okay, let me put it that way. And I'm, I'm one of them. It's just thrown natives, thrown <laughs> natives into the yard because I was told that, you know, you need to have some native. Okay, Sarah, you're pointing at yourself as well. 
when we come back, we're going to talk about some of these fails and some of the things that people have done. And one of the things I will say is if you have shade, there's no point in having ironweed in your backyard, especially in the city. Uh, that's just crazy, uh, even though it's still out there. I'm, I, I think I'm going to rip it out after this season. We'll see how it does. Uh, but there are others as well. And send us your comments uh, right to uh, Facebook or to Twitter or uh, the uh, um, the YouTubes. Uh, we've got a chat going on there. Uh, Peggy will be looking at those, and so will Kayla, and uh, we'll try to answer any questions that come in. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Stick around. More to come. with our plants, so help them thrive. The plants you're viewing were treated with Leafzyme, a foliage spray designed to activate beneficial microbes already present on the leaves. A spritz every few weeks promotes growth-enhancing microorganisms that process dust and other particles into nutrition that indoor plants can absorb through their leaves for beautiful and vigorous growth. Go to blazing-star.com and check out their BioGarden line for home gardeners. You can help slow climate change in 2021 by composting. And you don't even need a backyard. By composting communally in multi-unit buildings across Chicagoland, Collective Resource Compost has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. CRC brings you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter, they swap it out, and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectiveresource.us. Hello from Happy Leaf. This is BJ Miller, the horticulturist here on staff. The best way we can help you be successful with indoor gardening is to provide you with a really great grow light. There are a lot of choices on the market and it can be extremely confusing to decide what you need. Our goal here at Happy Leaf is to provide you with a light that lasts a very long time and makes your plants really happy. We have several satisfied customers, including our friends Mike Novak and Peggy Malecki, because we have specifically designed a light that is versatile, it's very effective, and it is extremely simple to use. Our lights are perfect for seed starting, but you can do so much more, especially these months of the winter. You can supply yourself with your own leafy greens and herbs, grow lots of different types of vegetables, keep your small fruit trees thriving, and your houseplants will think you've sent them for a day at the spa. Yeah, I know. I don't know why the audio didn't come on. It it should have. It's, I, the, it's I, the same gremlins that are affecting I, the, I are affecting it. the Facebook posts at the uh, moment. What do you mean? There's I'm, something when I'm posting to restream, it's then reposting again to Facebook. Uh, Kayla and I are busy uh, yeah, discussing boy. that at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I blame Mark Zuckerberg for all of the ills of the planet. Just letting you know. And uh, I want to let you know that this is the very, very, very last chance for you to take advantage of McHenry County College's course featuring organic vegetable farmer Atina Diffley, the author of the award-winning memoir, Turn Here Sweet Corn, Organic Farming Works, has one more workshop through MCC's Center for Agrarian Learning. Sign up for crop planning for market needs and profitability, and it starts this Wednesday. There are two sessions, Wednesday, January 27th, and February 3rd. It's only 5 bucks, and as part of your registration, you will receive either the Wholesale Success Manual or Direct Market Success Manual, an $80 value, published by Family Farm. But that's just the start of a bunch of events this year from the Center for Agrarian Learning. Their virtual farm tour series kicked off last Tuesday. Tour number two will take place on February 16th with tour number three happening on March 16th, so save those dates. For more information, go to mchenry.edu slash cal. That's mchenry.edu slash c-a-l. And by request... Let you come back to me. Mm. I 
All right. As I'm to be on way for your company, I'm hoping that you come back to me. What you gonna do in the wind? You gonna run away? There goes you. I'm gonna run away right by my side. You pretty baby, I even don't. Yeah, Ken, uh, when uh, I talked to Ken about being on the show, he said, well, uh, I want you to play some uh, Fats Domino for me. And uh, I said, uh, I, I'm not sure I could, but then I found this live performance, which was done at uh, Austin City Limits. So, do a little, need a little sax in there. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, YouTube, the YouTube hasn't figured out yet is how to, zap you for uh licensing well i guess you can't license a live performance i'm not sure how that works but mm. so there you go ken oh. you, you got your fat stamina I, I appreciate i was thinking of blueberry hill but th th i appreciate that one. i actually like this song better than blueberry hill so oh yeah it's a it's, it's just it, that was the one that was on my mind when i made the request uh, that, no that was great appreciate okay it. There you go. Uh, welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We're talking to Ken Williams, who's a horticultural dude, mm -hmm. and to, uh, to uh, Sarah. Sarah. Heard me back there a little bit. Okay, just lost that. Don't know where that echo came from. Uh, the same gremlins. Uh, Sarah McHale from the Land Conservancy of McHenry County. And we're talking. All right, we need to get into some specifics here. Yes, Peggy. Yeah. We do have a comment from one of our listeners, Kathleen, that uh, Roy Diblick's book helps with planning the no maintenance perennial garden. That's true. All right, let's let's address that for a second because one of the things about Roy Diblick and uh, uh, your wife, Christine Nye, Ken, has worked with Roy at the Shed Aquarium. They put that wonderful, uh, what do they call it, the bird? Migratory uh, bird garden. Migratory bird garden, uh, right on Lake Michigan, right outside the Shed Aquarium. Um, and She's I'm, dancing right now. Is she? <laughs> because of that? Okay, great. Just, just, just a little bit. But, but the thing is, uh, Roy is not, he, he's not a guy who says you have to use 100% natives. He's willing to mix in different plants, right? Well, Roy... He, it, it, I would turn that around. He, he uses native plants, but Roy's just a plant freak. He, he doesn't care. Um, <laughs> he, and, and, I mean, if you talk to him about the ecological benefits of native plants and stuff, it, it pretty much rolls off of him. Um, but, but he does have an incredible um, knack for how to lay out plants, and he – He's dialed in on how you relate personally with the plants and with the place. Well, and he's and dialed he, in on communities, too, which plants play well together. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And the fact of the matter is that, our, that, that it, you know, Perovska, you know, Russian sage, um, or, or, you know, things that are from different ecosystems really don't play well with, with our native plants. And, you know, there's some... Uh, you talk, You mentioned cultivars, things like the the uh, the summer beauty allium, which is what you see in every gas station parking lot in with the, the world. Perovskia as well. They they put those two yeah, together. Yeah. yeah, but the the nice the and the 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 um the summer beauty allium is a cultivar, a sterile cultivar of uh, Eurasian allium. It's not native by any means. But because it's sterile, it doesn't reproduce. It's not going to take over anything, and it does bring in pollinators by the bucketful um, because it, it does produce um, pollen and nectar. So, um, and that's and it's and it's it's useful in a design. And that's Roy's deal is more the design. You know, mm -hmm. get, getting getting it all to work together. Um, well, Roy has worked with. Good native plants. <laughs> what 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 was that, Sarah? What, Sarah, there are so many good native plants that we can use. We don't even need to spend any time talking about non-natives of cultivars. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, see, but that's the point I'm making. So uh, why don't you talk about that side of it, Sarah? Because there are people. Uh, all right. If you have a rose b uh, bush in your garden, uh, that's you're, you're not committing uh, an atrocity against nature. Uh, a lot of people love the roses. I would say, though, when 
when uh, Ken is talking about a whole uh, field of them, to me, that's a crop. That's not a garden. Okay. And, and there's a difference, isn't there, Sarah? Yeah. So I talk to people a lot about this on site visits. Like, use plants that aren't going to cause harm. All right. So, you know, there's certain sets of plants that are non-native that have been brought in by the horticulture industry that um, become invasive and escape mm -hmm. from your garden. So such, that's such one, as? That's one, um, burning bush. Yep. Mm -hmm. Burning bush is a very uh, commonly used landscaping shrub that people really love the way it looks. It keeps this really nice kind of mounded form. It turns bright, brilliant red in the fall. Well, guess what? For those of us that also work in the restoration world, we're finding that overrunning our um, oak woodlands, along with the buckthorn and the honeysuckle. So the choices that you make in your yard can make a huge impact on your local environment, no matter where you live. So roses, let's talk about roses. There are native roses that you can use. Pasture rose, Rosa Carolina, is a great example of a pretty well-behaved um, native rose that can be used if you've got some sun. So what I, because what I try to focus on when I make recommendations to people are the native plants. Okay, we need a champion. There's plenty of people out there making recommendations for um, cultivars and things like that, the non-native plants. Well, we need, as ambassadors, I feel like we're like nature ambassadors, we need to be the ones that are making these recommendations for straight native species. And we've, I, I, I'm just looking at a comment that came in, Siberian squill. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everywhere. Uh, that, and, that and the little white one, too. The white one with the green. Oh, I know yeah, which one. What what's oh now I'm gonna blank on what what is that little one with the little star? Uh, it's like Star of Bethlehem, I think. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <gasps> so but those anyway, are, but those we're, are we're, some of the things uh, that you have to be you have to be careful of the invasives and and let's go through uh, a, a quick list of them. You mentioned a burning bush and everybody loves their burning bush and they go oh it's not causing any problems. Well, no, not in not in the city on your corner lot. You're not going to see it pop up across the street in your neighbor's yard because they mow it every every week um but as you say sarah in in a forest preserve it might suddenly take over an entire area uh barberry is another one uh as i said butterfly bush the one that has those wonderful fragrant flowers that everybody loves the purple flowers and you can get them in pink and you can get them in, um white and whatever that has been banned in certain states, in certain countries, uh, when I was visiting London about 50, 20 years ago, I saw it growing out of cracks in walls, yes. like six feet off the ground, hmm. uh, a, a, a butterfly bush growing straight out of a wall. That's how invasive it is in England. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and, and of course, there's a difference between butterfly bush and butterfly weed because butterfly weed is Asclepius, which is uh, a um, is used spectacular use, and useful yeah. for monarchs. Yeah, we do have a question from somebody asking, "How are we defining what a native plant is?" <laughs> okay, Sarah, yeah. you're, you're you're nodding. Sarah. Go for it. Go for it. So a native plant is any plant that has grown in a certain region for thousands of years, generally, with no human intervention, okay? And if you want to find out the native range of a certain plant, what I recommend to people to do is Google the Latin name. If you can find the Latin name, that's the best thing to do. So just in your Google search bar, the Latin name of the plant, whatever it is, Esclupius syriaca native range. So put those words after it, okay? And you're, it's going to bring up a couple different really good resources. Usually Bonap is one. Um, here in the Midwest, you can also go to Prairie Moon Nursery's website. They've got a bunch of these maps that are in a really user-friendly way. So native plant, any plant that has grown in a certain region with no human intervention for thousands of years. You know, I like going uh, myself to uh, Mobot the Missouri Botanical mm -hmm. Garden. They usually have uh, some great information, too. All right, let's, 
uh, having done that, and we talked about people and those of us who have had uh, native plant fails in our backyards, uh, let me send uh, or show you guys some stuff uh, because you guys sent me some photos. Uh, just so folks know that everybody's working real hard to make sure that we do it right. So let's start with this. Ken, that's you on the right there. And it looks like the, the folks there are saying, oh, look, it's a bee. Run. Um, but they're, they're not, obviously. What, what is this photo of? Okay, this is um, the, we have an organization in McHenry County called the Wildflower Preservation and Propagation Committee, which, among other things, they do many things, but the, they have a mentoring uh, committee where where somebody with established native garden will um, mentor somebody who wants to start growing native plants, and they'll help them for a year. What you find a lot with people who plant native plants is that you know, in the third year, they're spectacular. And in the fifth year, they aren't quite as pretty as they used to be. And in the seventh or 10th year, you know, they're just a mess. And that's because people don't realize that in a small area like that, um, the garden, the, the, what's happened here is the original composition has been lost. There was a composition there once, there was a design. And it's been lost. And and D, the woman who's in the forefront there, you, what she's pointing at is she's saying, it seems to me like I should just pull these out. And we've put together what we call the Helping Hands Committee, which goes around and um, we, you know, when requested, we'll come and we'll talk to somebody with a five or 10 year old native garden. And very often the conversation is just the same. We go there. They'll point at something and said, there's just too much of this right here. And we'll say, that's right. It's okay. <laughs> it's, it's okay. You can remove plants from your garden. It's, it's not some kind of a sin. Um, just because they're native doesn't make them that, that that plant has to be in that spot. If you don't like looking at it, you need to do something about it. So you, there's a process, there's a just, process called editing, which is removing... Yeah. <laughs> It's like weeding, except you, you're weeding, you know, things that you originally planted. Um, and and w every time I remove something from my garden, it looks better every single time. Um, so it's it's an ongoing process. You don't just put things in the ground and then everything is going to be wonderful. If a seeded meadow is going to is a different situation. Um, where everything's growing closely together and you have so much competition that certain plants don't take over. But if something like a Canada goldenrod or something starts taking over, you might mm -hmm. be walking through there pulling those out once in a while. And Sarah can address that. Are you that. looking at me? Are you looking Grasping at Grasping them by the handful. Yeah. All right. Here's, here's another shot, Ken. Uh, tell us why you sent me this photo. That's, yeah. And the caption that I sent with that photo is too much of a good thing. That's um, uh, Echinacea pallida, pale purple mm -hmm. coneflower, mm -hmm. and you know, which is a great plant. And when they start coming up, volunteer in your garden. These are all seedlings coming up, and when they start coming up, volunteer in your garden. That's a good thing. But you know, even if you didn't know what this was, there's too much of it. You know, think of this as a mature plant. Um, yeah, I mean, the, those be, are going to get much larger <laughs> from that yeah. if, we, if we're starting yeah, at this size. Now, but yeah, yeah. yeah. And so when it's when it's in that state right there, you can take a sharp hoe and cultivate, you know, no more than a half an inch deep and remove 90% of them. Or, or um, move them elsewhere. It, or move them elsewhere. Yeah, if you have an elsewhere to go with them or if you have a neighbor who mm -hmm. is starting a new garden. Um, they can they can move elsewhere. You can pot them up. Um, everybody I know with native gardens has a, a place in their backyard where there's a bunch of stuff in pots. Um, and when people come to my house, Sarah's come to my house, she left with plants. Um, people, <laughs> you, you leave with plants. When you visit us, you leave with plants because we have, because yeah, we'll pot them up. And, but you can thin this out in just a few seconds and then it, it can develop into something. But left alone, if you do nothing, 
you know, you're just going to have a jumbled up mess. All right. I'm going to show, put another photo up here and explain why you sent me this one. Uh, Sarah and I both looked at this and said, <laughs> well, what's wrong with this garden? What's wrong with it is if down in front um, is what's called palm sedge, and mm -hmm. which in certain situations is a fine plant, but in this situation, it was so aggressive, and it, it has a. If you look at it, it has an. It's very unruly. Um, it's sprawling in every different direction, and this part of the garden, I, I don't. Of course, when I look at something and I say, "Oh, that's ugly," I don't take a picture of it. <laughs> and so I took this picture because at that moment I thought it was pretty. But within a year or two after I took this picture, that whole section of the garden that you see from the front back to that log and kind of a, an arc back there yeah. just turned into kind of an amorphous green blob. That palm sedge came in. It I had planted over. other Yeah, I had planted other things. There's some prairie smoke in there that got almost overwhelmed. Um a lot of stuff didn't actually die, but but they were really getting, and it, it just it wasn't it wasn't pretty. You looked at it, there was no. Um, Claudia West uses the term uh, the legibility of the composition, and there was huh. no legibility. You couldn't read it, and people have to be able to read the comp. When you look at something that's a mess, we're hardwired that if we don't understand what we're looking at, we're hardwired to think, you know, somewhere in the back of our mind, there's a chance that a saber-toothed tiger is going to come out and eat us. And <laughs> being eaten is bad, and people want to avoid it. And if they look at if they, a garden in the backyard is different. This is in my front yard. And I don't want people to be scared when they go past my house. <laughs> well, if you and want to be, they, I'm just going to say, if you want, who's, who's They talking? might not be really okay. scared. They might not be overtly scared, but at some level, there's some fear in there, and it makes them not like it. And it makes them, you know, if, if, if their husband comes home and says, did you see the native plants over in this guy's yard? You know, we should do that. And they say, no, we shouldn't do that. Well, because if, if you want to be scared, you can look at the photo that Sarah sent me <laughs> that she calls nine bark stupidity which is i i love sarah you sent the most the best titles for your photos here's nine bark stupidity all right sarah do you want to explain why you call it that um yeah so nine bark is a fantastic shrub to use in your home landscaping if you give it space okay so the this is an example of and this is my yard i am fully owning this this is a kind of <laughs> This is an example of nine barks um, planted too closely together. Okay, so a nine bark has a beautiful arching form to it that you really need to be able to see in order to appreciate it. And these are too close together to be able to see that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, That's one plant, isn't is, it? <laughs> I just have to throw this disclaimer in there. These are nine barks that were damaged. <laughs> and weren't retail worthy so they ended up in my yard um so oh. they had had some aggressive pruning done to them and i think that these nine barks actually look the best when they're not pruned when they're allowed to really arch out yeah so that's the nine bark stupidity okay and this is a common thing with a lot of shrubs where certain shrubs where people just cram them in and they don't plan for their mature height and width Mm -hmm. Okay, and here's another. The next one is called <laughs> Spider Wart Sarah, You Loser. Uh, I, <laughs> oh, that doesn't look that bad, Sarah. Okay, so this goes back to Ken's point. It doesn't look okay. that bad exactly right here. So in the front, that beautiful blooming plant, that's called prairie flax or flax pelosa. Mm -hmm. That is a great choice for an edge of a narrow garden. For some reason, I put some spiderwort in the back too because when I see spiderwort out in nature, I'm like, oh my gosh, you are so amazingly beautiful. I want you in my garden. It's extremely aggressive. Okay, within two years, it was spiderwort monoculture, just 
taken over and it looked awful. The form of spider wart is kind of random and spiky. There was nothing really textured to kind of like mute mute its form and it just took yeah. over. So to this day, I'm still removing spider wart. So what would you advise uh, if you want to grow spider wart? What would you advise in terms of the design? So don't put it in a small garden. If you've got anything less than like, I don't even know, 50 by 50, don't put it in there. Okay. Um, if you really, really want it, you've got to be super committed to taking tons of it out each year, that editing process that Ken talked about. You've got to commit to doing that. Okay. I don't want to do that my garden that's a pain in the or butt. put it in a Sorry. container as one of our listeners just posted uh-huh yeah sure. all right you can you can try it in a container too all right and finally the last <laughs> the last one you sent me is called no maintenance ha so <laughs> and this is no maintenance ha explain what's going on yeah. here sarah all right, so this is the very, very first native plant garden I had ever put in, had zero plan, and then two years later, I'm sorry, what was that? No, go ahead. I think that was a little back feed. All right, two years later, we moved, all right, and we still own the house. We rented it, and this is what happened with no maintenance, all right? The renters thought, even though I told them, but it need you've got to remove the weeds and stuff. They were like, oh, they're native plants. I don't have to do anything to this garden. Let me tell you guys, that's just not the truth. Things like ragweed in here, things Ooh. like yellow, the yellow coneflower just went insane. There was no editing, no maintenance done, and it became this really sad <laughs> situation. <laughs> so if you're gonna put native plants in, in a small garden, you've got to choose the right species. And I'm actually doing a program on that, on native and, plants in small spaces. And what is that thing that, that seems to be rushing towards the camera that's invading the lawn? <laughs> that's Creeping Charlie. Yeah, Whoa. that's Creeping Charlie, wow. right? So, like, like yeah, that. so that's a huge... <laughs> you can see it moving. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know. I've never seen such aggressive creeping Charlie in my entire life. Holy smoke. Uh, all right. Yeah. We, we have just a couple of minutes, so I need to show one of my fails. Peggy, I am so sorry I didn't get yours loaded up, but this is, oh, a, okay. this is a fail. And I had somebody write yesterday because I used this photo for my blog post, um, and somebody else said, oh, yes, that's my nemesis. And here it is, cup plant in the city. Um, I did not put those there. I'm, it's I'm, marching it's, down your alley. This is marching down my alley. They're growing out of cracks in the asphalt and the concrete. Um, this is start. This that's not even my backyard. That's a neighbor's yard. Um, and I started uh, growing cup plant in my yard, and then I realized that it will take over the world if if you let it. Um, now, some people would say, and I agree that when this is in bloom like this, it actually is kind of pretty. Yeah. But, somebody just asked, why is that a fail? Um, well, ex <laughs> seriously, they, they said, that's beautiful. Why is it a fail? Well, my neighbor didn't ask for it to be put there for one reason. Um, and, uh, it, it'll do that throughout your whole yard. If you let it, I had, when I would, okay. when I was digging a vegetable garden next door, when my neighbor was dead and I had the dead neighbor's yard where I could work, I had to dig out all of the daylilies and the cup plants, uh, which nearly killed me. Uh, before I could p even put in a vegetable garden, and that's what happens. These, uh, I will say, cup plant. Well, once cup plants get established, uh, they're they're pretty hard. If they're seedlings, yeah, they're really easy to pull out. So that's what you need to do. You need to get to them before they get crazy. So there we go. Let's pop and, that back and, in. And, and although we don't think, you know, we in native gardening we want to avoid deadheading because. Seeds are food for birds, and and seeds are wonderful. But there, there's a point where if if you know, if just take, cutting off those flowers before they make seed on that particular plant might make sense. That way, you still get to have the flowers, and you still get to enjoy it. And the foliage is doing is feeding whatever that foliage feeds, and you know, so you get some benefit. 
if you can answer a real quick question, Sarah, um, where was it? Uh, and it just got moved. It was about transplanting nine transplanting bark. nine barks. I planted nine bark next to my driveway. Will it tolerate transplant? It might. It depends on how long it's been there. I mean, try it. If you're going to do it, dig a lot wider than you think you need to and dig a lot deeper than you think you need to. And then keep it watered after you move it. Don't transplant it in the dead of summer. Do it when it's cool out. All right, cool. Well, listen, folks. Um, see, Ken, you were worried that we were going to give away your whole presentation. Uh, which, uh, which, what's the date of your presentation? It, it's four weeks from today, the twenty-first of February. So, what I'm going to tell folks is go to my website, MikeNovak.net, find the link, and sign up now because there's a lot of people. It's filling all, up fast. It is filling up rather fast, and and then there will be another one in March, and then Sarah, you do one in April, and yours is just a Q and A. So after they see Ken, they're going to be scratching their heads and saying, "Well, we need to ask some questions." Mm -hmm. um, and, and Stephanie and, suggests people go to the West Cook Wild Ones Garden Tour on the, their website to also see native plants. Yeah, so, uh, and that website again, Peggy, is? Westcook.wildones.org. And folks will get all the information they need. Ken Williams, horticulturist dude, and uh, Sarah Michael uh, from the Land Conservancy of McHenry County. You can find information about them as well on my website. Thank you so much uh, for joining us this morning. This was fun. We got to do it again. We got to do it again, Mike. All right. Okay. And thanks for getting uh, all the technical stuff <laughs> up and running just just in the nick of time. Yeah, give, give Christine credit. Yeah, I get credit for that. All right, Christine. Thank you, you, Christine. Thank you very much, Christine. You get to leave town now or wherever you were going. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Molecki. More when we come back. <laughs> okay. Let's say you have a problem. It's Monday morning and your car won't start. What's the first step? Find out what's causing the problem. Or, better yet, find someone who can. It's impossible to remedy an issue without first determining the cause. And when there's a problem with your tree or shrub, that's where Bartlett Tree Experts comes in. We call it Plant Analysis and Diagnostics. We'll start by accurately identifying your tree. This is important because a tree species will indicate its typical traits and tolerances, as well as any susceptibility to insects, disease, and other stress problems. Next, we'll look at the tree from the ground up. We'll check the condition of the soil, examine the root collar for decay or other issues, look at the color and health of the foliage, and inspect for damaging insects or disease. There's a lot to consider when making a correct diagnosis, and your local Bartlett Arborist has some unique support a team of top scientists at the Bartlett Tree Research Laboratories. We can collect soil or plant samples from your tree and shrub and send it to our lab for analysis. Our lab analyzes over 20,000 of these samples each year, so you can count on an accurate diagnosis. Our lab also functions as an education center for our arborists to receive ongoing training. So after diagnosing your tree problem, we can also provide the most advanced arboricultural techniques and treatments to help solve it. Successful plant health care is all about timing and early detection. If something is concerning you about your trees or shrubs, don't hesitate to let us know. We're happy to help identify the trouble with our expert plant diagnostic services. Welcome to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio with just a soup song of humor. Or is that a dash? Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Here they are again, Peggy Malecki and Mike Novak. All I need is good food to eat and make me healthy, wealthy, wide awake. Lettuce, tomatoes, root, and bacon. What about those sweet potatoes? All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good tools to make me music porch. And welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. So glad that you're here with us today. And um, uh, I'm going to remind folks that uh, if you get a chance, uh, sign up. 
subscribe to our I, we had a bunch of people mm-hmm. sign up to our, our youtube page this week so i'm grateful and i think part, part of it had to do with uh, the fact that i had a birthday um and yes thanks, happy birthday uh, thanks to all the folks i had a really good present because my birthday was on friday um and uh you know what happened on thursday so no my birthday was thursday and you know what happened, thursday, on, wednesday. What happened on wednesday right mm-hmm. so i had a really good birthday week okay uh, but a lot of folks um have followed us uh, on the Facebook page. Uh, just give us a like on Facebook. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't hurt. And um, so and like you, and a follow and like us on YouTube and subscribe to the channel, please. Subscribe to the, to the YouTube channel. Go to mikenovak.net and you can subscribe to the blog and uh, to our newsletter. Uh, and hey, if you really really ambitious, you know, go to uh, Apple Podcasts and give us. Uh, a rating. If you don't like the show, don't don't give us a rating. Yeah. Uh, if if you like the show, yeah, do something there. Give it, so. give us a rating. Give some comments. It helps move us up in the podcast too. Yeah, that way. absolutely. Okay. And tell your friends and your neighbors. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, and your enemies as well. Please do uh, all of that. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, uh, I see Peggy. She looks like she might be frozen there. So I'm going to bring in Nancy as well. Uh, Peggy, are, are you with us there? Hello? Let's see if it's a, her uh, her uh, uh, internet or whether it's something else, and I'm hoping that it pops back on. You know, sometimes what happens, we've discovered on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. You know what goes on at this time, don't you, Nancy? No. Church. Um, we have found that uh, it when certain ways it it can affect your internet stream it can it's just 10 o'clock um all the church services start and but what's funny is usually by about 10 13 or so um the internet stuff comes back so it makes me think that people are logging on to church just to to, so that the pastor knows (laughs) they were there and (laughs) and then they, they get off and they go and do something else so uh Ah, uh, you folks they, going they to church. They didn't like the sermon, so they're yeah. yeah. So they're leaving. No, they they're just changing don't, the channel. They just don't want to be at church. Okay, that's that's the thing. Uh, I'll tell you one of the things you could do, Peggy, if, if uh, Maleki, if is if you want to send Peggy Salazar the emergency phone number and see if that mm-hmm. will work for her. I yeah. I also asked her to try VMix again with her video off. Okay, we can we can try that as as well. Uh the reason that uh, Nancy is here is uh, uh, an issue that we've talked about for a, a while on this show and just continues to be a head scratcher uh, on uh, Chicago South Side. And, that, and, and I'm going to ask you, Nancy, just to tilt down just a little bit so we see less of your ceiling and more of you. Thank you. There we go. Um, Nancy, uh, as you can see, is from the Bloom Legal Clinic. Uh, at Northwestern Law, uh, the uh, uh, the full title, which I've got somewhere. Why don't you give it to us? Because it's on my blog here, but I don't have it right in front of me. Of the law school, Northwestern Pritzker School of Law, and we I am with the Environmental Adv- Advocacy Clinic, and okay. we represent the Southeast Side Coalition to ban pet coke. Right. Uh, the Southeast Side Coalition to ban pet coke which is one of a number of organizations that are working hard for social justice uh, on the southeast side of Chicago. And anybody who's paid attention uh, for any length of time knows that the southeast side is where, of course, all the industry uh, took place for uh, 100 years, Uh, steel mills uh, and that sort of thing. And now... Um, the steel mills have gone away. Uh, one of the reasons I was hoping to have Peggy Salazar is that she's from the Southeast Environmental uh, Task Force, and her husband actually worked in a steel mill until the 90s, and then they all packed up uh, and left. And the problem was they took the jobs. That went away. What stayed was the environmental degradation uh, caused by 100 years of industry on the southeast side of Chicago. So in the intervening decades, uh, folks have been trying to 
get rid of toxins in the soil, pet coke, which has been stored in the area, and that, that, that's where that coalition comes in. How long have you represented the uh, coalition to ban pet coke, Nancy? I think about eight years. Can, can you, you give us a quick update of, of where that issue stands? So pet coke is not a big, as big an issue now. Um, the pet coke was being stored in huge piles outside, and the city of Chicago, um, maybe six or seven years ago, adopted new regulations that prohibits outdoor storage of pet coke. So the pet coke is not as big a problem as it was originally, but the group, um, the coalition has stayed together because there have been continuing problems of, as you were describing, um, environmental injustice in the area. And in addition to all of the historic pollution, there are industries that are still operating down there and new ones coming in that are polluting. Mm -hmm. So people are dealing with the historic pollution as well as um, what's coming up into the air and into the soil now. As you mentioned, Nancy Loeb, um, you've uh, represented organizations dealing with pet coke issues, some of which have been resolved, some some not quite. Uh, but now we have another. Well, we have, there are several other issues on the south. It seems like every time there's a heavy industry that needs to be relocated somewhere uh, in I'll Chicago. On the computer, but I'm afraid it might go down. It's actually the internet that's going down. Oh, I'm I'm hearing. Um, we have Peggy right there. We have Peggy. So yeah, but but my internet went down, and I don't want it to go down again. <laughs> well, I let's, keep your video off. Then. That's that's okay. <laughs> let's just go with what we have here, Peggy. Um, we're, it's good to see you, and I'm I'm glad you're here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is uh, something that that ha happens, and folks, it was not on my end. I'm just telling you, it wasn't on my end. <laughs> It, it wasn't. Uh, and uh, just tilt down just a little bit, Peggy, with uh, your your uh, computer so we can see you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was just getting Nancy to explain uh, the situation with uh, General uh, Iron Industries, uh, which is a, a, a scrap iron company that was located on the north side of Chicago. It just shut down its operations. It was a... It was a problem. It, you know, as I wrote on my blog, it has had a checkered, at best, relationship with the folks in Lincoln Park, which is where it was located until the beginning of this year. Now the city, in its infinite wisdom, wants to relocate it to the Tenth Ward, uh, the southeast side where you're located. Why is this a problem, Peggy? Well, it's a problem because first of all. We already have uh, a number of scrap metal yards. We're, we're, we're desaturated with them. When the steel mills closed down, uh, they started taking all the uh, contaminated property and opening up uh, scrap yards. So they were popping up like mushrooms. And so we noticed, uh, according to the air monitoring data that's collected at the Washington High School, that there were high levels of, um, of metals. And so we were concerned that these scrap metal yards might be the source of them. And we felt that we didn't need any more of that kind of pollution in our community. And they're eyesores, they're tremendous eyesores. I mean, you know, can you imagine two story high mounds of rusting metal? Uh, it, it's, just, it's just not something that makes for a good. Oh. And we lost her there for a second, so let's go back here. And, and as she was probably going to say, Nancy, it, it doesn't make for good neighbors. It doesn't make for uh, a healthy neighborhood, does it? No, I think that's right. And I think part of what Peggy was going to say is that the south side is already overburdened. Mm -hmm. um, and the city has labeled it a quote-unquote receiving zone for this heavy, dirty industry. We don't have a fair distribution going on throughout the city. Right. Can you it, hear me? Yeah. Yes, yeah. we can hear Pe you, Peggy. Peggy, can you hear us? Yes, I can. I'm just going to use the phone 
because uh, my internet is actually the internet that all of a sudden is connecting and disconnecting. Okay, uh, well, we've got you here, and uh, and so glad to have you on the phone. And and Nancy was explaining. Uh, why having general iron on the south side is not a good idea because it's, it's frankly down the block from a couple of schools, oh, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's down the block from a school. It's it's across the street from a park. It's across the street from our neighborhood uh, shopping mall. It's just not a good idea to have it. And it's also along our river. Why does it get to sit on our river and not on the Chicago River? That would be the Calumet. That's the Calumet River, right? Betty? Yes, the Calumet River, yes. I'm feeling. sorry. <laughs> I well, forget that people don't know. People don't know where we are at all, so I should always remember that. Well, we also have listeners beautiful. across the country, too, <laughs> Peggy. So. Yeah, there's listeners across the country, and, uh, yes. the, okay, and yes. why don't you explain that? Or I can, which is to say the 10th Ward is on the south side of Chicago, uh, borders up on Indiana, uh, is right on Lake Michigan. This is where we had all the industry for 100 years. There were steel mills, and there were other uh, industrial uh, 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 entities down there. And now that they've gone, there's a lot of pollution that still needs to be cleaned up. I mean, the the uh, bringing General Iron down there is not the only thing, Peggy, is it? It's uh, you, you. You've also we've talked on this show, and you were with us in August when we talked about the Army Corps of Engineers at the mouth of the Calumet River planning to expand what is a to- basically a toxic dump, right? Yeah. So when they dredge the Calumet River in order to make it navigable by ships, because it's not naturally that deep, uh, they actually pull up all the legacy contamination and contamination that's running in there now. And so they can't dispose of the dredgings in the lake like they did at one time, because that would be polluting our lake. So what they do is they put it in what they call a confined disposal facility, which is basically a big hole, a big pit, and ours happens to sit on the mouth of the Calumet River. And because it is reaching its capacity, the Army Corps wants to put another one along the Calumet River once again in our community because our community borders the river. Um, and so we basically opposed it. But uh, they still now want to expand the existing one because it's all about what's cost effective for uh, the government and for the Army Corps to do. And so again, money and dollars come into play and community gets put on the back burner when that happens. And, you know, that's not even the issue we're talking about here today. <laughs> you know, no, no, that's not the issue. That's just one of the many issues. And, and, and before we uh, end uh, the show today, I just want to talk about our latest issue. Well, but yeah, for now, we're, we're definitely going to get to that. I want, but I want to get back to General <laughs> Iron um, and, yes. and, and Nancy. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, happened the other week, well, what's been going on is they need a permit. Uh, to be approved by the city of Chicago before they can operate on the south side, right? That's right. Um, They need um, a permit under the city's large recycling facility rules. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, right now is a time when there are, you can make a comment about it to the city of Chicago. Originally it was going to be, the deadline was going to be January 14th. That got extended extended to the 29th so the end of this week friday is when you can make a comment and i've got that that uh, email address uh, on my blog post if you go very near the bottom you will see that uh information about where you can send your comments it's env comments at city of chicago.org env as in environment env comments at city of chicago.org but again you can go to uh, that point. Why did they extend it for two more weeks, Nancy? We asked them to. They originally um, had the comment period going entirely through the Christmas and New Year's holidays. Um, so that that's, the that's kind period, of a common practice, though. This is how you... you right? The I comment mean, period originally would have ended right on December 30th. Mm-hmm. And wow. we thought that was pretty disrespectful of the community, and we asked that it be extended to January 15th. It's yeah, been but, but extended that, again yeah. because the 
the city issued a deficiency letter to um, the company that is actually going to be owning and running this, RMG, saying that listing 34 points of the application that were deficient and calling it substantially deficient. And the application increased from 300 pages to 1,000, and we were given a whole two extra weeks to comment on, on 1,100 pages. Extra 700 uh, yeah. pages. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, unbelievable. Uh, and uh, what I was trying to say is that this is kind of common practice among government entities, which is if they want, if they're looking for comments, they do it over a holiday so that more people, more people lose track of it. This is pretty common. Um, what I don't get here, and by the way, uh, when we talk about General Iron Industries and um, uh, RMG, which is Reserve Management Group, uh, Peggy, I'm going to address this to you. Uh, I call it a bait and switch because it's basically the same company. It's just owned by a different management group now. Right, Peggy? Yeah, that is correct. So they can call it RMG, but it's essentially General Iron, uh, RMG and General Iron sort of formed a partnership or RMG bought General Iron. Whatever the case is, it's just General Iron with a different name. I'm sure they're going to be processing the same contracts. I mean, it's like everything that was at General Iron will be coming down to the southeast side of Chicago. That's basically what's going to happen. So it's General Iron relocating here. It's as simple as that. They can call it what they want. Our mayor has called it different things, but it's General Iron. And as Nancy just pointed out, even the city has already said to them, well, we don't like what you did here, uh, you know, in December, they're, they're, they're slapping the wrist of this company and saying, do it better. Um, it's just, it sort of points to the myriad problems that we have bringing this company down to the southeast side, not the least of which is environmental justice uh, or lack thereof. And that's what really fries me, is I do not get that the city of Chicago doesn't seem to understand that the people of the 10th Ward don't want this. So I have to ask you, uh, Peggy, where does your alderman mm -hmm. stand on this? Where does the mayor, uh, Lori Lightfoot, stand on this? Our alderman said that she opposed it, but she didn't oppose it as far as we could see. We never saw any place where she actually opposed it other than verbally telling the community she opposed it because aldermen have quite a bit of clout. And so if she had said she didn't want it, and like I've said to her myself personally, if you had said you didn't want it, and we saw that you did everything within your power to stop it and the city ran over you, we would, have, we would highly respect that. But we didn't see that happen. And so we felt that she sort of spoke out of both sides of her mouth and uh, wasn't really doing what needed to be done. But you also have to remember, she was a fairly new older woman. And so I think the city took advantage of that. But it, it, the end result is we're getting general iron. It's coming from a community that is predominantly white, predominantly affluent. They're beautifying the river. They're greening it up. They're doing all the wonderful things that we, we're glad they're doing for the sake of the river. Uh, but then they decided that they're going to push it down to us. So there are a number of things coming and that have come our way because of this uh, revitalization of Chicago. And so we tell people that it, it dawned on us that the 10th Ward was here to accommodate the revitalization of the city of Chicago, but not to partake in revitalization itself. And so uh, that's where we get it's unjust, it's been set on the theater. I mean, we could list a whole multitude of reasons why it shouldn't be that way. And so the communities are waking up, and they're like, wait a minute, we're no longer, we no longer want to be victimized. Right. Uh, victimized is, is a good word. Some people have used the term sacrificial zone uh, for, yeah. the, for the 10th mm -hmm. Ward. Um, so, Nancy, what is it that the Bloom Legal Clinic and you can do? We're going to keep fighting as hard as we possibly can. So we have already submitted comments. Lawyers working with the communities, groups have mm -hmm. submitted comments. 
and we will submit another round of comments um, on the pending application and point out repeatedly, as we have done and continue to do, that um, this facility doesn't belong in this site, that it, the history of how this facility has been operated, including in under the management of RMG in Lincoln Park, has repeatedly been a burden on its neighbors, and it shouldn't happen. Um, we're just going to keep pushing back as hard as we can, hoping that the mayor will listen. Um, at some point, you've got to hope that the mayor will listen to the people who live there, as well as protect the health of the people in the 10th Ward. They don't deserve any less protection than the people in Lincoln Park do. So on top of and so this brings us the, to the other thing, and we'll wrap up with this because it just this is what just makes you roll your eyes and wonder why the city of Chicago can't, can't seem to have room for environmental justice on the south side, uh, where it does uh, in other places of the city. Uh, in addition to uh, General Iron being proposed to come down to uh, the tenth ward, in addition to uh, the uh, the Army Corps trying to expand the dump at the mouth of the uh, Calumet River, we have this other really weird thing going on where a group wants to come in and dig, uh, create a uh, an underground vault uh, in the Tenth Ward, the Zinga Brothers Inc. A uh, six million square foot warehouse underground. Oh my goodness, Peggy, what is that all about? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. But but it's basically mining. It's mining the uh, limestone. Chicago sits on vast amounts of limestone, so they want to mine the limestone for construction. And in doing so, of course, they will create these caverns. Uh, our concern is about the mining itself, because when you mine limestone, believe me, it's a dusty operation. So not only will we have heavy metals in our air, now we'll have more lime dust. And so this is what we're saying. When you concentrate heavy, dirty industry in a community, you basically doom that community. And so this is why we're talking about, well, let's be fair, let's figure out how to do this, but putting the mine in people's backyards is not going to make the situation better. And so uh, this is why we're also looking at that now and saying, you know, how can anyone even expect that that's okay to do? And so, uh, again, mining. I, just, I mean, people, think about mining, right? Explosions, uh, heavy equipment, you know, constant noise. This is not what we want for a community. We, we want to see a better community, a more vibrant community that hasn't happened since the close of the steel mills, we've been waiting and waiting. And we're losing patience. And none of these things that are being proposed is going to accomplish that. Uh, nobody's addressed this, so I will. Um, and that is, I, I don't understand why Mayor Lori Lightfoot doesn't seem to understand the environmental injustice that's being done on the south side of Chicago. Uh, I, personally, I, I don't think that she has particular interest in environmental issues anyway. Uh, and uh, in this particular case, uh, it's just more egregious than in some of the others. Um, uh, I'm concerned about recycling. I'm concerned about there's, there's going to be a, a, an ordinance introduced this week uh, regarding uh, the or weed ordinance, which has slapped people with fines, $600 and $1,200 fines for putting native plants in their yards. Maybe that's going to be corrected finally. Who knows? It's kind of hard to say. Uh, but uh, certainly in terms of the 10th Ward in the southeast side of Chicago, I, I, again, I'm scratching my head and saying, why doesn't the mayor seem to understand what's at stake here for the basically uh, uh, Latino community? Um, and you would think that the mayor would understand underrepresented communities, but that's not the way it it's playing out. So, uh, you, Nancy, you know, Mike, it's, go ahead. Mike, it's even more than that. You you would think that 
the mayor would want to develop a vibrant Chicago, not just pocket, not just pocket, because that's not going to make for a uh, quality city. You have to look at the city as a whole. We've been saying this for a long time. You know, they tend to focus on one area and then another area. And then, I mean, and that takes forever. And in the meantime, the first area they're focused on starts to break down. They need to come up with a better way of approaching how they redevelop the city itself because we are a post-industrial city and we need a lot of funds, we need a lot of attention, we need some creativity, we need some new ideas, and it's not happening. And so this is where I say the city falls short also. All right. Peggy Salazar from the Southeast Environmental Task Force, thank you so much. If you want more information and on how you can write to the city and, and, and give your opinions about what they're planning to do or trying to do, uh, go to Southeast Environmental Task Force on Facebook. That's a great place to go. That'll keep you up to date. Uh, Nancy, is there uh, any place else you would recommend people go to uh, get information? Um, the city has a website for this particular um, facility, and all you have to do is plug into your search, RMG, and Chicago Department of Public Health, and that will take you to some information on what's going on and links to give your comments, um, reminding people that the comments are due at the end of, the, of next week on the 29th. Please go ahead and make your voices heard. All right, and you can do that also. Go to my website, mikenovak.net. Go to this week's blog, and I've got the link there as well. Uh, Nancy Loeb, thank you so much. Peggy Salazar, sorry for the technical difficulties, but we got through them. Um, and uh, appreciate both of you being on the show. Uh, please keep us up to date. Uh, it's important, and we will follow through. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki, Rick DeMille, Weather and Climate, coming up next. Hello from Happy Leaf. This is B.J. Miller, the horticulturist here on staff. The best way we can help you be successful with indoor gardening is to provide you with a really great grow light. There are a lot of choices on the market and it can be extremely confusing to decide what you need. Our goal here at Happy Leaf is to provide you with a light that lasts a very long time and makes your plants really happy. We have several satisfied customers, including our friends Mike Novak and Peggy Malecki, because we have specifically designed a light that is versatile, it's very effective, and it is extremely simple to use. Our lights are perfect for seed starting, but you can do so much more, especially these months of the winter. You can supply yourself with your own leafy greens and herbs, grow lots of different types of vegetables, keep your small fruit trees thriving, and your houseplants will think you've sent them for a day at the spa. You have the ability to give your soil a superpower. It's called composting. If you don't have a backyard, you need to contact Collective Resource Compost. CRC has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. They bring you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter from your kitchen, they swap it out and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectiveresource.us. At this time of year, we spend a lot of time indoors with our plants, so help them thrive. The plants you're viewing were treated with Leafzyme, a foliage spray designed to activate beneficial microbes already present on the leaves. A spritz every few weeks promotes growth-enhancing microorganisms that process dust and other particles into nutrition that indoor plants can absorb through their leaves for beautiful and vigorous growth. Go to blazing-star.com and check out their BioGarden line for home gardeners. Rick DeMille's coming up, but first, Peggy. Yeah, okay. This is the very, very, very last chance for you to take advantage of McHenry County College's course featuring organic vegetable farmer Atina Diffley, the author of the award-winning memoir, Turn Here Sweet Corn Organic Farming Works, has one more workshop through MCC's Center for Agrarian Learning. Sign up for Crop Planting for Market Needs and Profitability, which will be presented this Wednesday, January 27th, as well as February 3rd. It's only $5, and as part of your registration, you will receive either the Wholesale Success Manual or the Direct Market Success Manual, both an $80 value, and they're published by Family Farmed. 
But that's just the start of a bunch of events this year from the Center for Agrarian Learning. Their virtual farm tour series kicked off last Wednesday, but tour number two will take place on February 16th, and tour number three is happening on March 16th, so save those dates for virtual farm tours. Now, for more information, go to mchenry.edu slash cal. That's mchenry.edu slash cal. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Now, Rick, you have a choice here. I can put your live image up here, or I can put the photo. Uh, let's, oh, let's get his live image. He's waving to us, so there he is. We get Rick. the map this way. That's true, the big map go. behind And our, our, map. our viewers actually get to see Rick live. Uh, there, yeah, this is and every cool. once in a while, the, the squirrels attacking their breakfast up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, tell folks about that map behind you. It's a very cool story. Um, it's a very cool map. Um, the map is about, I'd say, 10 feet by about 8 feet. Um, my son, Julian, and I got it one day at a, um, it was like, it's like an antique card shop. It's on Central Avenue, uh, right off of Green Bay Road. and um, in, in Evanston. You know, in Evanston, right, 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 because there's a lot of centrals on the north yeah, there side. Yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, there really are, um, and in, even in Chicago. Uh, but we were out, you know, we were out antiquing. We 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 always did a lot of that, even on Belmont and Damon, those kind of places. Um, and we walked down into the basement, and there was a ton of stuff that was just laying around, filled with junk and dust and dirt. And I noticed this map was actually um, down there, but it was laying on top of one another in two pieces. And you can see the, the middle right there actually mm -hmm. comes together, both at the top and the bottom. So it took me about a month to restore it, and I did it with lukewarm water and ivory soap um, and mm -hmm. cheesecloth. That was the only way to remove the dirt. But after wow. a while, wow. I think I was cleaning it too much. Yeah, after a while, I was cleaning it too much, and it started to wear away. At the, so I stopped right there, let it dry, um, and hung it up. I don't know where the map came from. I don't know the origin of it. Um, it is a Rand McNally map. Um, I think it was probably produced somewhere in the 1930s because there's no interstates on there, but there's railroads, there's county roads, there's city roads, there's neighborhoods that, or I should say small towns of every single county in the United States, Mexico, and Canada. Um, and Mike, you remember when I was living in that big apartment in Rogers Park, it filled up my entire wall. Right. And it literally becomes a, 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 a piece of conversation where, or a conversation piece, or a place of conversation, I meant to say, mm -hmm. where people just stand there and look at it. And everybody does this, particularly people like us. Um, you begin to go back and you look at a per certain part of the map and you go, I was there. I was there. Mm -hmm. So even the other day mm -hmm. when you were saying your brother who lives in Manistique, I looked on the map and there's Manistique. I mean, there's literally every single small town. I got a feeling it was a map that was probably produced for the post office uh, back in the 30s or 40s. But it really is amazing. And <clears throat> I, never, I never get tired of looking at it. Unfortunately, because the couch right now cuts off Florida, Texas, and parts <laughs> of uh, Texas, I don't see that. Uh, but other than that, it, it really is it really is kind of cool. Um, so I've moved three times since I got in the map, and every time I move, the question is, where are we going to put the map? <laughs> not, it's a criteria not the for of selecting where you move, yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's really interesting, Peg, real quickly. When we moved into this place last April, the first thing I, I said to Rebecca was, our armoire is not going to fit up the stairs. And she's like, no, it'll fit up the stairs. I'm like, it's not going to fit. And sure enough, the day that we moved, the movers are like, it ain't going to fit. I'm like, all right, what do we do? So they literally went, I'm not kidding you, up these, um, not up, but I, I, I shouldn't say up these, but this back patio has um, sliding glass doors up on the top. So they lifted uh -huh. it two floors, lifted it two floors, set up the doors and put the armor in. Yikes. And, yeah. Yeah, and as they were doing it, I was helping them, and then got the last push up. I went like this, <laughs> um, <laughs> and the uh, the armor got through the uh, sliding glass doors. Wow! So, um, yeah, so that, that's the short of it. You know me; it's tough for me to tell a short story. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, 
anyway, um, we're getting a little a little uh, uh, internet freezing, but I can hear your audio, so we'll just we'll just continue and see what pops back. Uh, you sent us some stuff, and I have to admit, I was pretty amazed at something I was not aware of. You just opened my eyes to the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary in the Gulf of Mexico. I had never even heard of that before, Rick. Um, and and uh, just uh, on the 19th, uh, there was an article from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, on how the uh, the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary is expanding from 56 square miles to approximately 160 square miles, uh, and it's a, an important habitat there. And I look, and so I went to the site to look at the video, and the video's amazing, and yeah. and it's just incredible. And I had never even heard of it before. I I don't know, but Peg, do you know whether or not that was something that Obama got going? Off the top, I don't know. Probably. Okay, yeah, because I, I know he... would be my guess. He, I'd have to look it up. He, I know that he had instituted a lot of, um, you know, rollouts of new places. It could have even been Clinton. I don't know. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. And the good thing is that all of the things that we know Trump kind of rolled back, you know, Biden is very quickly, you know, pushing back forward. So um, I'm, I'm, hoping that, I'm hoping that keeps going. I still have my... Um, I still have my reservations on him just kind of axing the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, I, I don't, I tell you the truth, I don't think that was a good idea. Um, I think he needed to keep that going, especially during a time when you, when you need to keep the jobs going and the economy going. And just, just canceling it for the sake of canceling it is almost like a Trumpian move. Um, I know that there's some concerns about the environment with it, uh, but I think the the alternative is now transporting, you know, oil and gas by trucks, um, which mm -hmm. obviously does uh, does harm to the environment because they're burning gasoline. Um, it takes a long, a, lo a longer uh, time to do that. It's more expensive, um, and I'm I'm probably one of the few environmentalists who think that the, keeping the Keystone going um, is probably a necessity. It's not a great necessity, but it's better than the alternative. I excuse me. I I and, and I. Yeah, go ahead, Peggy. I was going to, real quick, George H. Bush in 1996 established it. That wouldn't have, uh, that, that wouldn't have been 1996. Okay. Yeah. That, would, that would have been Clinton in 1996. Um, okay. January 17th, 1992, Stetson Bank was added to the sanctuary in 1996. Okay. Okay. It's, it was the 10th National Marine Sanctuary that was established and, in and 1992. I, and I will say that, uh, Rick, I couldn't disagree with you more about the Keystone XL. Uh, I will just yep. say that uh, I think it, it has as much to do with respect for indigenous populations as it does uh, anything. I don't think it's necessary for it to keep going. Uh, and I think that... Um, I think one of the reasons that uh, that Biden uh, nixed it is that uh, he's indicating there's a new sheriff in town and there's a new way we're looking at in uh, climate change. And it sometimes you need to make a statement, and I think he made a statement. And that is what I think. And I don't think that, yeah, there will be some jobs lost, uh, but there are jobs lost when you do any, when you shut down coal mines. So um, this right. is part of that, and, and I just disagree with you about it. I think he could have waited, put it that way. I think he could have waited. Well, I think bit. that was his point, doing it right away, first day, to make that statement. You make that statement yeah. by, by doing it on the first day. So anyway, we, we, we yeah. happen to disagree. But the national, uh, if you get a chance, go to uh, NOAA, N-O-A-A dot gov. Uh, let's see, where was the link that was on here it's, that I was? Uh, well, the main site is flowergarden dot NOAA NOAA, dot gov. Right. Go to flowergarden.noaa.gov and, and just take five minutes and look at that video yeah. they have up there. It's, yeah, it's really neat. wow, mm -hmm. just, just so cool. Um, but it uh, looks like uh, folks have finally settled in on what was the uh, – and by the way, folks, yes, we will talk about snow. So we're just teasing you here. We're keeping you uh, in suspense because uh, we, we will get to that in a sec. But uh, – 
uh, kind of the opposite of that seems to be the idea that 2020 was Earth's second hottest year. We've been talking about that for several weeks, but finally, yeah. scientists have kind of, Noah's kind of settled on it. They say it was number two. Right. And, you know, it's interesting to point out also, um, I've been emailing back and forth with a friend of mine who's a long-range forecaster for um, a private firm, also for DHL, who does a lot of shipping. And so far, the months of December um, and January have been the warmest ever to date for Fargo, North Dakota. And this mm. was supposed to be a year where we were supposed to have cooler than average temperatures during, due to La Nina. And so far, guys, the long-range forecast for temperature for the Northern Plains couldn't have been more wrong. And that's alarming because it goes to show you that um, if you're just kind of pinpointing long-term or long-range three months out based on, you know, equatorial temperature of the Pacific, um, clearly there's a lot more that's going on with the warmth of the North Pacific that has completely eradicated, you know, this, this cool down. And there's still, obviously, you never just go with one thing. There's probably two or three other things. Um, mm -hmm. Whether or not the MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation, which is in, this, in, in the equatorial regions, latches on to this energy and moves it inward or inland. Um, whether or not the absence of late season typhoons did not alter the jet stream in a wavy way. But, you know, so far we're getting into the 24th of January and even the next two weeks out do not look cold. And even though there was a bit of a splitting of the polar vortex, as you alluded to last week, Mike, um, part of it went into Western Europe and part of it went into Russia but it did not make it over the North Pole and into the, um, and into the Great Lakes. And part of that could be maybe due to the fact that we had so little ice um, in, the, in, in the Arctic heading into the winter season. And you look at the Great Lakes right now, and Noah just issued a report yesterday that this is the, the lowest amount of ice percentage-wise that we've had on the Great Lakes as of January 21st. I think we're at 3%. Now, it doesn't mean we can't be 15% or 20% by next week, but when you just look at surface ice, this is the lowest we've ever had up until this point. That's also probably allowing us to somewhat stay warmer. So, you know, the reasons are, you know, many, you know, why our long-term forecast for cold did not work out, but maybe it means that we have to start thinking differently due to a changing climate as well. Yeah, I I would think that there has something to do with that. Um, uh, something else that uh, you sent us, uh, speaking of changing climate and how we need to adapt to it, is uh, some of the laws and uh, rules and uh, uh, presidential decrees that have been made over the past few years are not going to be reversed immediately. I mean, we talked about the Keystone mm -hmm. XL. Yeah, it takes but time. It was, but it was kind of interesting because I was reading some of the stories you sent uh, uh, about how uh, we got to, that even the Trump administration in some cases went through proper channels to change things, which meant writing regulations, going through the courts. And I'm trying to imagine a judge saying, well, yeah, that looks good. There's no such thing as uh, climate change. And uh, so, yeah, let's, let's pass that law. Let's revise that uh, rule. Um, that it has me kind of scratching my head, but, uh, uh, the point being that, uh, for some things, uh, uh, an executive order will suffice, but in other things, it's going to be back into the courts and rewriting regulations and it's going to take years. Or, or yeah. can go down the wrong path by, by reversing it and then they can't pass a new one that's similar. Yeah. And, and I think, and I think, you know, what, what Peg was talking about reversing it, Mike, I just, I, I, I didn't want Biden to look like Trump did on day one, where he's just reversing everything that the previous administration did. I get that. Even though you're, you're even, even though you're, you're giving your supporters, yeah, look what I'm doing. Trying to be unif a unifying person doesn't mean that you completely reverse what the other people had. You, you go through it, you know, step by step by step. Um, and I think I, I think I think he needs to pull back just a little bit on that. I and, don't. You know, the <laughs> I, I, I don't. I'm just. I'm. You know, it's the it's the optics. The optics. I don't. I think the optics 
are, are not pushing across the aisle. I just well, don't think they are. I'm, 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 again, I'm going to disagree with you on that. So right. at any rate, uh, it'll be interesting to, to see what happens. So I'm going to pull up something that you sent, but that uh, Peggy sent to me earlier today. So I, I already had this, and it is this graph of what's going to happen in Chicago in the next 24 hours or so. Um, and I'm looking at yeah. that, that little red blob right over Chicago yeah. uh, and up into uh, lower Wisconsin for the potential for heavy snow. Yeah, and, and this is really interesting because, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, the strength of the storm is probably about a 5. Uh, the duration is going to be about an 8. Uh, the impact will probably be about a 5 or a 6. But that red there is... Um, not so much lake effect snow, but a long duration of lake enhanced moisture that could keep the snow going for a longer period of time. Um, but two things I think really are important to point out is that, you know, we mentioned before about the Great Lakes at 3% ice coverage. This is all the Great Lakes, all of the Great Lakes. So that means that the lakes are most likely warmer than normal. So the fact that you don't have any ice on the lake means that you're going to have a tremendous amount of beach erosion. Um, this is going to be very similar to what happened uh, in January of 2020 when we literally had about 48 hours of 30 to 35 mile per hour winds. So beaches from Waukegan down through Wilmette, down through the city of Chicago are going to probably lose, you know, 10 to 15 feet of sand I would, or beach. I would not be surprised. Um, normally ice this time of the year, which there was a little bit of pancake ice, on the lake yesterday, ice this time of year kind of produces somewhat of a buffer. We don't have that. But what's also yeah. interesting to point out, Mike and Peg, is the last time we were able to measure the surface temperature of the lake uh, with satellite image was about a week ago. And Southern Lake Michigan was almost 40 degrees. That's insane for this time of the year. So the fact that the air coming across the lake is still not cold enough to produce lake effect snow of any great degree the fact that the lake is still rather warm, it's almost acting like early December, two things can yeah. happen. It could actually slow the amount of snow developing on the front side of the system due to the fact that it's too warm. But on the back side, uh, it may enhance it from a standpoint of more lake effect snow. So the lake front is going to get either a lot of beach erosion or a little bit more snow. We say a little bit more, maybe two to three inches, not a big deal, but enough where we will probably be close to seasonal normal of snow by the time this thing is all said and done by Wednesday afternoon. So what do you, what do you, what do you expect the uh, total accumulation to be? Well, I was hoping for about one to two out of this today. That's not going to happen. We'll probably nope. squeeze out about a half of this. Um, and then most likely anywhere between five and as much as eight inches area wide, uh, right along the lakefront, maybe an additional nine to, you know, an additional one to two. So there could be some places that may squeak out eight and a half, maybe nine inches of snow. Uh, it's also going to be kind of wet at the onset, which means that it's going to compact a little bit. Uh, it's also going to blow around a little bit. So measurements are going to be kind of dif difficult to come by uh, from a standpoint of accuracy. But the bottom line is if we get six inches of more snow, that'll be our biggest one of the year, and that'll put us uh, right at about 15 inches. Normal right now is about 17. But the that good point – I don't want to make is that this is finally going to be enough snow to go cross country skiing. And make <laughs> That's the important point. And and I that's was important. looking at the maps you sent us. It was interesting because the clipper coming through that's like coming from the north, and this is coming up from the south, which is why the low pressure is wrapping around, and we're going to get that snow coming off of Lake Michigan, which doesn't always right. happen here in Chicago. Uh, no, I mean when it when it does, it's a big deal. But again, usually by the time you get to the twenty fourth of January. The lake is completely frozen over. That eliminates any sort of lakefront um, erosion, and it also eliminates the possibility of lake effect snow. So the fact that our Great Lakes are completely wide open um, makes it very, very concerning to people who have beachfront property either here in Chicago or on the other side of the lake in Michigan when you get these big storms. This, this is, I still think, one of our, our biggest concerns living in the Great Lakes over the next 20 to 30 years is to how to protect the lakefront beaches. It's it's not a. There's no easy answer at this point. 
All right. Well, give us that forecast and we'll get you out of here. All right. So a little bit of snow today, about high, about 32. Um, snow won't begin until about 4 or 5 o'clock tomorrow afternoon when you wake up in the morning. Um, it should be about 4 or 5 inches of snow on the ground, maybe another inch or two by Tuesday afternoon, maybe another inch on Tuesday. Uh, no. No, come on. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> got it no come on we were so as a cliffhanger we were so close we were so close that's it huh that <laughs> cliffhanger oh, okay well i tell you what maybe i just popped that uh graphic back up there because uh i i think we we just uh okay that's <laughs> okay so let's just <laughs> do this let's just play some music and thank you snow's coming yeah, let me get rid of that picture. There we go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my goodness. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks to everybody who was <laughs> on the show. Ken Williams and, and Sarah McHale, Peggy Salazar, Nancy Loeb. Hey, we got to say this is Kayla's last day. Kayla, thank you for all the great work you've done over the weeks and months. It's uh, She's going to New Zealand, so congratulations. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and thanks to Kathleen and to Legata and Basil. Until next time, go green or go home. Uh, Stadler? Yeah, uh, what? Is that it? Yes, it's over. How'd you like it? I don't know. I slept through the whole thing. Well, you didn't miss much. <laughs>